Street um, up to Alderbrook on the Hood Canal. Um, absolutely a beautiful setting. We spent three days up there um, really um, thinking about our residency program, what the strengths were, and where we wanted to move um, the program uh, in the future. And we had um, nearly 40 people there, um, departmental leadership, um, faculty, residents, staff, um, and we really spent uh, a wonderful three days um, brainstorming about um, residency education. And to set the stage, one of the things that we said right at the beginning of the education retreat um, was that we really um, had to sort of sail our programmatic ship, if you will. Um, notice the little flag there. Um, that's Kelly. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> We had to, sorry, Kelly. We had to, we had, we had to, we had to navigate between sort of a modern day Scylla and Charybdis, um, with the ACGME um, up on the cliffs, and we needed to really steer clear of trouble with the ACGME, but also avoid what we re, uh, referred to as the vortex of doom, um, the the whirlpool of sort of. Um, finances and, and details that might bog us down in really thinking about sort of a, um, creating an ideal program. I'm not sure, being um, having a bit of sailing and boating in my past, I'm not sure which looks worse, the, the real sail in Charybdis and in the straits between um, Sicily and, and Italy um, uh, or the, uh, the cartoon version. But either way, we really, this is sort of, um, how we said we have to we have to think about the program at the retreat, and we'll deal with these other things afterwards. We started off by talking about our core values. What do we as a program really value? What do we want to hold on to? And what do we want to base our future design on? And, and boy, a lot of really strong values came out at that meeting, but as many of you know, um, we um, focused our core values on three um, big ideals. Um, curiosity, because it leads to discovery, clinical, um, medical science, life in general. Um, a sense of community, because having a sense of community just either within the program itself or as part of a larger community really breeds a sense of responsibility. And finally, the value of compassion, um, because compassion just reminds us of the greater humanity that we all belong to. And, and to the patients that we take care of. And so after um, working on these core values, we then turn to our mission. And this is a complicated mission slide, but basically using those values, we said our mission is to really train the next generation of leaders in medicine, regardless of career path. We want to be a program that embraces all career paths, um, but the, a central theme is leadership. And we realized in order to do that, we had to provide a world-class and we believed highly individualized learning environment. And the next part of the phrase um, comes from John Sheffield, who really reminded us at the retreat that outstanding patient care and out outstanding training are completely indistinguishable. And if we forget that, we won't be able to achieve the kind of exemplary outcomes that we were really looking for as a program. Um, and then um, in that context, we wanted to meet um, these goals, the, um, if you will, to meet the individual educational and mentoring needs of our residents in a supportive and caring, and the joke came from the Alderbrook Retreat, a huggy environment. Um, thanks, Mark Tonelli, for that one. Um, and with that mission, we then um, turned to our educational philosophy, um, which was really to um, work towards an educationally motivated curriculum, not a service-based curriculum, to keep the residents' educational needs forefront in our minds, to build um, and provide a broad-based foundation during the intern year. That was really already here as part of the program, and we wanted to maintain that. And then focus more narrowly in the senior years on a defined core curriculum that we thought was essential for all internal medicine residents but to allow for much greater individualization of training based on an individual resident's career goals through more elective time, more mentoring, 
um, and pathways. So mis values, mission, educational philosophy, and so in order to get there, we set some long-range goals. And our vision was simply to become the best internal medicine residency program in the country for our residents, for our individual residents, not based on outside metrics, but so that every graduate of our program, this is our goal, every graduate of our program says at the end of their training, wow, I can't imagine going um, to a, a better program. And to do that, we said we laid out a 10-point plan, if you will, to create an educationally motivated curriculum, develop individualized learning plans and pathways, improve and increase our ambulatory training, build a strong sense of community, create a global health pathway. I can't honestly tell you why we called this out separately from this at, at the retreat, but we did, um, to foster strong faculty residency and subspecialty relationships, develop a faculty development program, an e-learning and web-based curriculum to foster a more scholarly environment for our residents um, and to be fully compliant with the ABIM and the ACGME. And, and I think as I reflect back um, and over the last six years, I think we've made a lot of progress in a lot of these areas. There are some areas um, in which we haven't made as much progress as we um, would like, and, and those are going to be areas of focus for the next few years. But it has been a really busy six years. We have decreased the number of um, inpatient mandatory rotations uh, for the residents and thereby increased the amount of elective time. We've created our really successful um, uh, clinic immersion blocks, um, a, a really successful curricular innovation um, developed by Caroline Rhodes and, the, and other faculty in the program uh, and clinics, and uh, developed a full day clinic model at last count, which was just last night, <laughs> um, we've created 31 new elective rotations in the last six years, 23 of which are these thematic ambulatory blocks, as opposed to the old cafeteria-style ambulatory blocks, um, uh, a, uh, a design that was um, pushed um, by Greg Gardner and others at the Alderbrook retreat. We've created five new inpatient elective rotations and three pathway-related immersion blocks in addition to the clinic immersion blocks. And we've added five new whammy sites, um, Anchorage and Ketchikan up in Alaska, um, our Naivasha, sort of our whammy uh, Africa site um, in, in Naivasha um, that was, um, Carrie Farquhar has helped build. And this um, year, it was the first year that we actually had a chief resident based in Naivasha, um, Eliza Monroe Weiss is our chief resident there this year, and um, Camille Peronin's going this coming year to be chief resident in Kenya. And then two new sites that we're bringing um, on for this coming year, um, Wenatchee and Cheyenne, Wyoming. We've developed um, our pathways. Um, some are more developed than others, uh, works in progress. The Global Health Pathway under Kerry Farquhar has been incredibly successful. The HIV medicine pathway, also incredibly successful under Sharisha Danaretti's guidance. Renata Thronson has helped us develop and lead a clinician educator pathway now in its second year. Joyce Whip um, received funding to create um, a center of excellence in primary care education pathway, um, a pathway within our primary care track based at the VA. We're focusing more now on our research pathway, and, and Conrad Lyles has um, agreed to help us um, mentor uh, the MD-PhDs in, in our program and to build our research pathway. And then we initially started off with a hospital medicine pathway, and um, uh, many programs around the country have hospital medicine pathways, and that didn't take root as uh, strongly as some of the other pathways that we designed. In fact, some of the residents told me, um, they said, you know, can residency training really is a hospital medicine pathway? <laughs> you know, what kind of unique things can we learn regardless of our career goals? Um, and so we're currently morphing this into a healthcare systems or a health systems pathway that we're currently designing. We don't yet have um, a pathway director, so if anyone's interested, see me afterwards. Um, but to, to really um, focus on um, 
QI, patient safety, advocacy, um, health systems for people who are interested in bringing those aspects uh, uh, into their training program. We've increased our emphasis on scholarship um, through scholarship blocks. With and we have a more rigorous process for selecting and assigning our research time now up to three months of dedicated research time, uh, scholarship time in our program. And anecdotally, much more productivity from residents during their training, traveling to national meetings um, and publishing papers and abstracts and um, writing other scholarly um, uh, things. <laughs> but, um, we've created our mentoring program. This is actually the first year of RAMP, our residency advising and mentoring program was my first year as program director. It was actually designed um, uh, by uh, residents and um, Finley Wallace and Joyce Whipp prior to me starting, but it, it came into being uh, my first year. And then finally, in 2011, we had to implement the new ACGME duty hours. And for that, we had to completely or partially redesign most of our inpatient services. And many of you know that was um, kind of a painful process. Um, and we, where we moved from our old bolus Q4, Q5 um, overnight call model for admissions to more of a day medicine, night medicine, um, drip model of admissions. Um, uh, <clears throat> we moved to full day clinics, um, as I mentioned already, but less frequently on some of our inpatient rotations and more often on consult and ambulatory rotations. This has actually led to a net increase in the amount of time residents are spending in clinic, um, which has been a really great thing. Whew. So, no wonder if Kelly's tired. <laughs> um, but um, as Shakespeare said in The Tempest, um, whereof what's past is prologue. Um, and hopefully we're not actually plotting a murder uh, <laughs> as, uh, which is actually what, where that line comes from, from the Tempest. Um, but, uh, but really, um, what we've done so far is primarily to set the stage for what's um, coming next. And I want to talk about some of the new challenges that the residency program here faces. Um, and this is a, a brief list of some of our, our new challenges. One of the biggest things is the next or new accreditation system uh, that's coming um, from the ACGME and going into place this July um, for our program uh, and next year for many of the fellowship programs, most of the fellowship programs. I think we really do need to assess and think about and respond in a thoughtful way to some of the consequences, both intended and unintended, of the most recent duty hour reforms from 2011. We're just in our second year of that. We've already had to make changes to some of our uh, some of our rotations, and we need to really think about um, uh, what impact those changes have had, and, and think about making more changes. We know that we need to expand both a core and an advanced level training for residents who are interested in systems, and our new pathway will be part of that. But we really need more of a curriculum for all of our residents in QI and patient safety. Um, we want to continue to evolve and improve our mentorship program. One of the big things that we're doing is actually <laughs> the vortex of doom is actually pulling on us. Um, and funding um, does, <laughs> surprisingly, get in the way of many of the things that we want to do. So we've been working with the development office uh, and other, um, uh, other avenues of funding for, um, to support some of the training opportunities that we've wanted. Uh, to, to do. We obviously want to continue to advance our educational philosophy and come closer to achieving our vision and goals and, as we talked about um, just yesterday again, to really continue um, to build good doctors. This program always has had an amazing reputation for building um, terrific physicians um, and we obviously want to continue to do that and not lose that as we face these new challenges. I want to talk um, primarily about these top two bullets um, for the next few minutes. The new or next accreditation system, as many of you know, um, uh, is a new system of, um, uh, of 
both evaluating um, trainees and programs using sort of a whole new paradigm as published by Tom Naska in the New England Journal now about a year and a half ago. And as I alluded to, the two main components of the NAS are both a different way to accredit us, training programs, and a different way to evaluate our trainees, our, our residents or fellows for the fellowship programs. Um, and the, the phase one starts this July. Internal medicine is one of the first programs um, to roll out the NAS along with these other programs. And all the fellowship programs will actually come a year from now. There are seven main components, if you will, of NAS that fall under those other two broader bullets. Um, one is we have to do more annual online updates to the ACGME. And, and they're going to be tracking surveys and board pass rates and um, faculty surveys. Um, the institution will be visited um, in something called a clear visit from the ACGME. But the thing that's brought the most amount of uh, conversation and anxiety, actually, are um, the use of milestones to evaluate residents. And from Tom Naska's article, he says a key element of the NAS is the measurement and reporting of outcomes through the educational milestones. Um, we in the program, um, led by John Cho, Chris Knight, several of the staff, many of the other faculty, um, all the rotation directors, have been working really hard on um, this evolution and we are going to be rolling some of this out um, this July. I don't want to go into too much of the nitty gritty, but what I hope that you as faculty and residents will see at the end of this, I actually think this is a good thing. I think if it, if it works, there will be more emphasis on direct observation of trainees, more emphasis on coaching and formative feedback, um, and less emphasis than on simply grading and summative feedback at the end of a rotation. Um, what it will take are actually, uh, is actually the development of rotation-specific evaluation forms. Every one of our rotations will have a new evaluation form that's unique to that rotation, the components of which will ask about levels of entrustment. That's the phrase. Um, how much do you trust this resident to do this activity that's really common on that rotation? So for example, perhaps here on the wards at the University of Washington Medical Center, um, one of the components might be managing a patient with decompensated liver disease. And you'll, you as a faculty member will be asked, how much do you trust this resident to take care of a patient with this problem and with how much supervision? Lots of supervision, a little bit of supervision, or they're ready for complete independence. And I think that makes much more sense. We're not going to ask you. Know, we're not going to ask you to sort of, you know, on a scale of one to nine, or more recently one to three, assess SBP. I mean, what is that anyway? I'm not even sure what PBLI is. I've just actually, in, in truth, I've actually just started to figure that out, and now they're changing it on me. But. Um, but nevertheless, I think that it will make much more sense to faculty and much more sense to residents um, to be able to know where they are on that scale of entrustment and what they need to do to get to the next level. So I'm hoping that it will be a much more formative evaluation system. You'll see a lot more of this over the next few months. Many of you have already heard presentations on this and will be coming around and doing a lot more faculty development. Um, over the next several months on, on the new accreditation system. Well, what about, um, what about work hours? What impact have the work hours had? Um, and I think, as I mentioned already, it's really important to sort of uh, assess um, where we are with the duty hours. And sort of a brief history of work hours reform, um, starting back in 1984, um, with the uh, well-known Libby Zion case. And then in 1989, where New York State um, passed uh, a law restricting resident work hours. Ten years later, in 1999, the Institute of Medicine published to Air is Human, pointing out many of the medical errors that occur in our hospitals and healthcare institutions. And shortly after that, in 2003, the ACGME adopted um, their 
the 80-hour work week and the 30-hour shift rule. Yes, there were plenty of other components to that round of duty hours, but in fact, those are sort of the headliners. Um, and, uh, and, and programs around the country sort of struggled and grappled with that. And then more recently in 2011, the 80-hour work week was maintained um, for interns. Um, it, the um, adoption of the 16-hour shift rule, maximum uh, shift rule, and for senior residents down from 30 to 28 hours as a maximum shift. Again, those are sort of the main headlines of that. Um, and since 2003 and since 2011, um, a lot of people, there's been a, a huge emotional response, obviously, to many of the, of the duty hours. And, um, uh, and a lot of it is sort of nostalgia for the past, the way we did it before. And, and to borrow a phrase from a friend of mine, Eric Holmbo, from the American Board of Internal Medicine, he calls this nostalgialitis imperfecta. <laughs> right? I mean, how often have you heard this in the last few years? <laughs> so the syndrome's characterized by, well, when I was an intern, insert superlative, or medicine was so much better, and residents, I've heard you say, medicine was so much better two years ago. <laughs> and Dr. Bre well, I won't say how long ago Dr. Bremer said. <laughs> Um, or younger physicians today are so much less skilled because of less opportunity for this or less training in that. And here's a quote I found in the literature, actually, about NI. Um, the most common criticism made it present by older practitioners is that young graduates have been taught a great deal about the mechanisms of disease, but very little about the practice of medicine. Or to put it more bluntly, they do not know how to take care of patients. Any guesses on when that was written? Oh my gosh, who said that? 1927. Was that you, Erica? Yeah. 1927, Francis Peabody in JAMA um, uh, wrote that. Of course, he then went on to try to debunk that, that sort of the haze of nostalgia about what we really learned when we were residents versus what we learned later in practice becomes a little bit blurred. But, um, uh, but, but, this sentiment's been around a long time. But in all seriousness, I think we really do need to assess the impact of duty hour reforms on patient outcomes, resident perceptions of training, resident well-being, and how residents spend their time. And data are just starting to come out in this regard, um, uh, in, in this area. And so I want to cover some of that. A lot of us have worried that patient outcomes would be worse. And in a brand new publication, from April in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, a study um, uh, entitled Implementation of 2003 Duty Hour Reforms was associated with an improvement um, in risk-adjusted mortality. And, it, and they do a complex, it's a very complex study based on Medicare data and using common DRGs for different specialties. And for, the, for medical specialties, um, so here on the left, 2000 to 2003 is sort of the baseline, pre-institution of 2003 duty hours. But there has been, um, initially there wasn't much change, but there, there has been a decrease in the odds of mortality in more intensive versus less intensive um, teaching hospitals since duty hour reform. Now obviously this study, this doesn't study causality, we don't know that it was the duty hours that cause this, but certainly at a minimum we didn't see a rise in patient mortality after the 2003 duty hour changes. Um, uh, lots of other outcomes we could look at, but mortality arguably one of the most important. Um, and so very interesting data that, that haven't shown um, a worsening of mortality. Uh, since those duty hours. We need to see what happens with the new 2011 duty hours as we get out five years and more um, to collect data. Well, what about resident well-being? In a, in a wonderful study um, done here, um, presented this spring, done by Mike Krug, Heather Davidson, Luke Wander, and Joyce Swift, um, where the objectives of this study were to investigate resident perceptions 
of the new 2011 um, duty hour changes, and also to look for changes in, um, in resident well-being over the last decade here at the University of Washington program. The methodology was basically an anonymous survey to all the internal medicine residents in our program um, last spring. And the survey consisted of depression screening, um, burnout screening, career satisfaction questionnaires, um, and the assessment of residents' perception of the impact of change, um, uh, the impact of the ACGM changes. And, and they basically were able to compare, they used the same survey um, that Joyce used in previous studies. There's a baseline study done in 2001 and then in 2003, uh, the 2003 duty hours, and there was a second survey conducted. And then in 2011, the new duty hours, and so the I'm gonna show you data from the current survey um, from just last spring. And here you see resident impressions. Um, the questions were, describe the overall effect of the latest work hour limitations on your education, on patient care, on resident well-being. So these are perceptions um, and uh, well over, uh, well, over 60% of um, <clears throat> residents felt that the new duty hours would negatively impact their education. They were less sure about the impact on patient care, where about 40% said there'd be a negative impact, about another 40% said no impact, and a few said a positive impact. Um, but all, nearly 50% um, were worried that resident well-being would actually not improve um, based on the, on the new duty hours. But then looking at the rest of the data, um, Mike and, and his group showed that actually resident well-being is improving over time. So in yellow, you see the data from 2001, light blue from 2004, and in purple, um, 2012. Residents um, are happier with their career choice there's a visual trend, although it didn't reach statistical significance, uh, towards less burnout, but a statistically significant improvement or decrease in the number of residents that screened positive for depression. So overall, um, despite the concerns, um, some evidence of improvement in resident well-being. How about on how they spend their time? Um, are they getting the education that they need? And again, just this spring, publication from Hopkins and the University of Maryland, an observational time motion study uh, of interns um, in the wake of the 2011 duty hour reforms. And what they did, um, they basically um, lumped, they followed interns, um, and they lumped all their activities in a day into four categories, direct patient care, which was defined as time with patients or with their families, admitting or follow-up um, or family meetings, educational time, um, attending rounds, um, and, and included in this were rounds outside of the room. Um, rounds inside of the room were actually um, considered direct patient care because they were in front of the patient. So educational time, rounds, teaching, conferences, indirect patient care, writing notes, writing orders, doing handoffs, all the paperwork or computer work, calling consultants, um, arranging um, discharge plans, things of that sort. And then miscellaneous, eating, sleeping, walking. <laughs> How much time were they walking um, and not doing anything else? Um, well, you guys can probably guess the outcome of the study. Only 12% of an intern's time is spent with a patient. 63.6% .6 of the time is spent in indirect patient care. 9.3% um, of the time walking, eating, sleeping. Um, <laughs> uh, and then um, educational time, um, almost about 15% uh, of their day. That sounds crazy. How does it compare to historical, uh, to previous studies? And I got the following data from Sanjay Desai, um, who was the program director at Hopkins, because they um, put, to, put this slide together. 
And they've compared it. This is in purple is the most recent study from this spring from JGIM. And there are four other time motion studies um, in the past that they looked at and uh, where they could classify care as indirect patient care, direct patient care, education, and miscellaneous. And basically, the general trend um, is that residents are spending more time on indirect patient care, less time on direct patient care, less time, at least from this study to this study on education, and less time miscellaneous, the bulk of which was sleeping, because residents are not sleeping in the hospital anymore. Um, in terms of doing that. So if you take, so it looks like residents basically are spending less time with patients and more time with, with the chart slash computer, if you really want to um, narrow it down, um, than they were in the past. And if you actually calculate based on a typical 14-hour day and you use the data from Hopkins in Maryland, this is what it looks like. On a typical 14-hour day, interns are spending 1.7 hours with patient, doing patient care, direct patient care with patients or families, 8.9 hours doing indirect patient care, two hours doing, uh, in education, and a little over an hour walking. <laughs> but what's the correct amount, right? We don't know what the correct amount is, really, other than it looks like it's getting less. We don't know what the correct amount of direct patient care is. But actually, perhaps the ACGME said it best for us. Um, and the ACGME says, and I believe, that for the resident, the essential learning activity is interaction with patients under the guidance and supervision of faculty who provide value, context, and meaning to those patient interactions. So I think we need to get things back into better balance. I think um, we need to get these scales back you know, a little bit more aligned and get residents um, to have more time with their patients, and, and which will be more educational in and of itself, and um, more time for education. How do we do that? Well, I think um, uh, we first have to sort of understand the problem, and in an, in an editorial um, by Ken Ludmer and Lara Goitian, who was a fellow here at the UW a few years ago, um, they point out that from 1990 to 2010, the annual admissions to teaching hospitals increased by 46%. PGY positions across the country only increased by 13%. Length of stay fell by a third, and the intensity of care per admission has greatly increased um, in the last 20 years something I think we all recognize. And thus, by the time of the 2011 ACGME duty hour reforms, residents were already doing more in less time for sicker patients than they were for previous generations of house staff, certainly compared to when I was a resident, when patients got admitted for elective workups and things. Um, the work hour limitations, I think, have smoothed out some of the peaks and valleys of work, but they've made it much more steady. Um, they have assured um, opportunity, at least, for more regular sleep, but they really haven't changed the total amount of work that residents have had to do. And this has led to the concept of work compression, um, something that we knew about ahead of time. We tried to anticipate this prior to the 2011 duty hours. Um, but I'm not sure we did a very good job um, of dealing with this. And as a result, every day, the residents basically are playing beat the clock. I got to get out. I got to get out. I got to get out. Um, and with ever increasing um, <clears throat> uh, complexity of patient care, with patient acuity, decreasing length of stay, the EMR, CPOE, um, coordination of care, all the forms that have to be filled out, what really gets squeezed out is time with patients and time for learning. And I think as a solution, we now need to focus not so much on time, on hours, but actually on the work itself. And I think we need to try to convert some of that excess indirect patient care time into direct patient care time and educational time. Because I think if we do that, and we have more time with patients and more time for education, we actually will have greater patient satisfaction, greater provider satisfaction and faculty satisfaction, 
And actually, I postulate greater efficiency of patient flow through the hospital to meet hospital needs as well. So how do we do this? How do we recapture some of this direct patient care time? Um, well, we could roll back duty hour reforms and let interns stay overnight again. I think that's not very likely to happen. Um, it's possible. It's possible, but I'm not sure we can plan for it. Um, we could decrease the number of patients residents see, you know, decrease the caps um, further. We did a little bit of that on some rotations, but you know, I'm not really very much in favor of that either because it's the patients we learn from. And if we decrease the number of admissions that we have, we're going to decrease the amount of learning that we get. So how can we make the rest of the day better? And these are some ideas that I have, and I'm sure you have many others. Um, but I think geographic cohorting of patients, decreasing the walking time, <laughs> um, and allowing, if, if patients are spread all over the hospital, residents are not going to be able to meet with the family very readily or just pop in the room. Instead, they're talking to the nurses on the phone. Um, we're moving in the direction of multidisciplinary rounds on many of our um, services, and I think those will be beneficial. More bedside rounding, not hallway rounding, bedside rounding, um, I think uh, will get us in front of the patients more and make us more efficient. And I think, um, at least talking to the residents, they spend an inordinate amount of time every day trying to coordinate discharge and doing um, discharge med reconciliation um, hours, sometimes um, per day. And one possibility is to shift this, some of this work away from residents, maybe to the pharmacy, to discharge coordinators, um, UDFs at Harborview. And, and I know many, many um, of these efforts are already underway, but I think we need um, to move more in this direction. So um, other goals I have for the, for the upcoming year, as I mentioned, further development and rollout of NAS, create creative solutions for work compression and excess indirect patient care. And another thing, building good doctors, I also want us to focus back on some of the basics, physical exam skills, better teaching and evaluation of handoffs, presentation skills, things that we know that have slipped a little bit um, uh, in the current era. And I want to get residents back to the bedside. I want to improve our procedural training, um, including with point of care bedside ultrasound, um, which also helps bring residents back to the bedside. I mentioned the fact that we um, want to increase the amount of QI and patient safety that we're teaching the residents, but also getting them involved in projects. We're currently applying for a new chief resident position at the VA, a chief resident quality and safety. If we get that funding, that'll be a new position for July 2014. And as we develop our health care systems pathway, I think that'll help provide um, a backbone of a curriculum for the residency program as a whole. Something I haven't touched on but is related to health care systems is we need to teach more of cost-conscious, high-value care. Um, and continue to work on resident scholarship, evolve our ramp program, um, continue to evolve our other ambulatory and inpatient experiences. And finally, um, a big push right now in the residency program is to work on the alumni fund uh, and other forms of development to help provide funding for many of the opportunities that can't be funded anymore under traditional GME funding mechanisms. Um, and if we really want to um, continue to evolve our program, I think we need to, um, to do that. So in summary, um, the program has made huge changes, I think, over the last six years in response to both internal and external motivators. Resident well-being um, seems to have improved. Patient outcomes do not appear to have worsened. But work compression has popped up um, and has created new dilemmas residents spending a greater proportion of time on indirect patient care in front of computers and less time with the patients. Uh, and I think we need to um, work on that. I do think the next few years with the NAS and work dealing with work compression, as well as these other goals, the next few years are still going to be very active. And you'll continue to see a lot of change in the residency program. But I do believe the program is healthy is strong and is moving forward towards achieving many of the goals that we set out six years ago at the Alderbrook retreat. And I hope you think so too. Now, um, <laughs> in 
my last few minutes, oh my gosh, so many people to thank for all this work um, that's gone on. Um, and first and foremost, um, our fearless leader. Um, Dr. Bremner has been an incredible source of support for me and for the program. I'm so grateful to him for um, everything he's done. Here is Dr. Bremner in his intern class. Can you find him? There he is, <laughs> right next to Hunter Hansfield, as it turns out. And if you don't believe me, there's the blow up. <laughs> you haven't changed a bit, Doc. <laughs> So many, many thanks um, to Dr. Bremner. Thanks also to the service chiefs at the hospitals, Ginny Brody, Bran Adderall, Heather Davidson, who I work with very closely, who are incredibly supportive of the residency training program. All the APDs that I work with who've, worked, who've basically done most of the work that I've described along with our staff. Donna Devine, who's been a great advisor um, in helping us avoid that vortex of doom. Um, the hospitals. Um, it hasn't always been um, an easy conversation, but the hospitals have been incredibly supportive of the residents and, and helping provide at least some of the funding for some of the things we want to do. The GME office, office staff is unbelievable. Um, and finally, a um, person who I've spent more time with in the last six years than almost anyone else. <laughs> uh, my dear friend Kelly Corning, who's just done Tons of work. OK, one last, two last big thanks. One is to Finley. Finley Wallace managed this program and sailed between Scylla and Charybdis for over 30 years and has really um, just was so gracious and so wonderful in shepherding me along early in my years and giving me graduated autonomy, just like the residents. Um, <laughs> uh, over time, and I am so grateful for everything he's done, for all he's given, and I want to publicly announce that he continues to give. And he just made a generous donation of $25,000 to the Alumni Development Fund. So thank you, Finley, very much. <laughs> And finally, to the people who I come to work for every single day, who make, who bring joy to my life and, and direction to my professional career, who I fondly refer to as the greatest house staff in the known universe. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the future of medicine is bright because they are your future. Thank you very much. We want to save time for the awards presentation. We have time for just a couple of questions. Whoever gets the microphone first. Ken, that was an excellent talk. I commend you. you guys on all the hard work uh, putting those uh, conferences in and, and, and working on this stuff. It's really, really hard work. DERM, we're starting to do it now. And, and uh, one of the things that I think we're going to be struggling with is, is mapping these entrustable professional activities back to um, our evaluations for faculty to do. Can you talk a little bit about your guys' process and um, sort of where you are in that? And can we have a sneak peek? <laughs> um, you may have a sneak peek, um, not right now. Uh, but, um, you know, um, uh, uh, John Cho and Chris Knight and many others are really working on this. And John is actually gaining a national reputation, has been speaking at uh, some national meetings on how to do this mapping. And it's. Um, that's actually what takes a lot of work. It's not so much creating the professional activities for each rotation that we want to focus on. It's the mapping back to these reporting milestones and, and competencies. 
And what we really hope, the big effort it, that we're making is to work with MedHub, our electronic system, to, to if we define the mapping behind the scenes, that um, then when you check the box that I trust this resident to manage a patient with decompensated liver disease, that it will backfill and populate um, the, the reporting milestones that we need to do. So we're trying to make that happen electronically. We can add, come by the residency office. We can absolutely show you a sneak peek of some of the stuff we've got. Amy? Hi. Hey, Ken. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, thanks for the plug on this side ultrasound, by the way. I actually wanted to uh, talk to you briefly about the, um, or ask you about the uh, busy work. I mean, uh, indirect patient care. Um, so concerns about um, discharge planning and the medication reconciliation, all those sorts of things, those have been concerns, uh, I'll not call them complaints, for a long time in our program. And the question is, what sort of realistic support are you getting from the hospitals um, to, to solve that problem? Because that's really where a lot of that is going to come from. Right? Yep. It, it comes down to money and, and other staff doing work that right now the residents are providing for yeah. a lower cost. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I can mention briefly that these conversations are just starting, that the, re that the hospital leadership um, seems to get it, because their motivation is to get patients out of the hospital faster and to improve patient satisfaction. And, and so I think they get it. The problem will be the vortex of doom. It will be funding extra pharmacists to do discharge med reconciliation and those come or discharge coordinators and um, those conversations are just starting and you know it's a difficult financial time right now so I think we just need to continue to try to work in that direction but I haven't gotten a lot of promises yet is the short answer to your question all right thank you very much everybody